uh, this type of overproduction to the problem of the consumer rather than the problem of the companies who actually produce this waste. Hi all, welcome to the third and also last episode of Moral Shame Talks called Clashing Behavior. Today I'm here with Christina, who's a behavioral science master student at the Radboud University. She moved to the Netherlands from New York less than a year ago and has been enjoying it here since. Her research interest focuses on subjective well-being and decision-making, and currently she's researching temporal discounting and how it is related to encouraging people to make sustainable decisions. Hi Christine, and welcome. Thanks for having me. Well, I would like to start with a fragment of the Shame Talks with Elena that represents the theme of this episode. How do you experience moral shame? It's the feeling of doing something wrong and it feels not done. I want to change and buy more sustainable and good for the environment, but I eventually do not do this. And that's the thing I find the most difficult. It's the feeling of I need to do something I need to behave more sustainable, but I just don't do this. I see it as a paradox. I think a lot of people can relate to the example shown, me personally as well. Even though I know what's going on in the fashion industry, I still struggle with this feeling of moral shame and experiencing a paradox. I know I have to live and buy more sustainable, but sometimes I have a hard time pursuing this. And together with Christine, we're going to discuss this struggle and we're going to look at moral shame through the eyes of behavioral science. We'll focus on sustainable versus unsustainable consumer behavior, on where responsibility lies, on the impact consumers have and can have, the definitions of sustainability, education and information. And this all revolves around the question, what plays an important part within the relationship between and what can we learn from moral shame and unsustainable consumer behavior? And this answer is something we will try to find out throughout this episode. Well, Christine, you've been interested in sustainability and temporal discounting. Um, so the idea that people prefer smaller short terms over longer term rewards. And in fashion, this temporal discounting is really crucial because you cannot go to a website or take a walk through the city without seeing a red, of course, <laughs> sale sign somewhere. And I noticed when consumers buy uh, these products, so buying a sweater in the sale or just a regular pants, they see themselves as the ones who are responsible for this and then again feel morally ashamed because of this choice. And I was wondering, what is your view on this? And who do you believe is really responsible for consumers and their focus on the short term instead of the long term? Uh, So, again, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Um, Well, you brought up my research a little bit on temporal discounting. And again, the idea, the general idea that people prefer shorter term rewards over longer term rewards. And how this is going to be related to sustainability is that uh, people may prefer to shop more fast fashion because uh, you can get more clothing for cheaper. So, for example, yeah, okay, you can spend 30 euros on a sustainable cotton tank top, or you can buy three of those tank tops for 10 euros at like an H&M or another fast fashion brand. And this idea uh, of temporal discounting in relation to sustainability, it's the idea that it's really hard for us to collectively really think about uh, the impact of our decisions here in the now and how it's going to affect our environment in the future and what that's going to look like. Of course, we know that environmental change is already happening all around us. And it's really important to help people uh, discount less and really think more about the future. Um, You know, one component that I think really struck me and that I think is really related to your idea of moral shame and the way that you defined it is uh, cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is this idea of having conflicting values and beliefs. So, for example, like the most famous uh, example people use is, you know, a doctor who tells his or her patients, uh, oh, don't smoke cigarettes, but they themselves are chain smokers. And uh, this idea of cognitive dissonance can really cause a lot of anxiety in people. Because, for example, in sustainability and in sustainable fashion choices, as I think 
we will discuss a bit later, and uh, a lot of people have the desire to act more sustainably and be more sustainable and really have this value and belief system of living sustainably, yet they still make unsustainable choices in terms of how much meat they consume or uh, buying things with lots of plastic packaging or buying things from fast fashion brands, which we know don't really care too, too much about the environmental impact of their constant output and production of clothing. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned cognitive dissonance because that's also a part of my research, but I I call it affective dissonance. And that's a term I came across in a, in a research on sustainable consumer behavior. And it's actually a fusion between cognitive dissonance and the affect theory. And the affect theory means actually that, um, yeah, our world is not simply shaped by, by arguments and by rationale, but more as well by emotion and feeling and mood. So uh, affective dissonance is really about the conflicting emotions or feelings you have when participating in fashion. So I think that's really... Uh, really interesting and really relevant as well for the feeling uh, of moral shame. I believe uh, when we solely focus on the consumers as the ones who are responsible, uh, when we blame our personal selves for the systemic problem, and of course with temporal discounting, it's a systemic problem because it's getting crazier every time. Sometimes the sale even starts before the season really starts. And um, I think it shifts the focus from the real stakeholders who should be held accountable. So the fashion companies. But who do you believe change should come from, actually? Yeah, well, of course, um, it's really difficult because I think there have been uh, quite... We can, we can see, we have a lot of evidence that show that there has been quite a huge shift in the later half of the um, 1900s to shift uh, this type of overproduction to the problem of the consumer rather than the problem of the companies who actually produce this waste and should be the ones responsible to close the loop, for example, uh, with this fast fashion or be more ethically responsible with the way that they create the clothes in terms of amount of water used or types of dye used or even um, the human ethical impact of how much they're paying their workers and where they're outsourcing their work. However, you know, uh, companies respond to what the individuals want. And I think that consumers often don't understand the power that they hold in their hands. They're their money, the value of their dollar or their euro that they have. This is the power that they have to vote with their money. And I think that uh, because this individual is just so powerful and it's really important that we encourage people to make more sustainable decisions and really make sure that they understand how powerful they are. So for example, in my research uh, with temporal discounting and sustainable attitudes, uh, we're looking at how episodic future thinking, EFT, affects temporal discounting. And what this type of intervention is, it's you essentially ask people to envision themselves in the future, right? In a situation in the future, you ask them to envision themselves and really take in all the senses of themselves, what they hear, what they see, what they think, and by putting them in this future mind state for quite a little bit, you see that there's a reduction in uh, temporal discounting. These effects are pretty short term from based on the literature, but it's very promising and hopeful to perhaps give people more tools to uh, boost themselves into making more, making better decisions. In psychology right now, there's a really big trend in understanding how to give more power to individuals by, of course, giving them different skills and competencies and creating these types of interventions that will help them have more self-agency in their decision making and uh, help people effectively create and set and achieve goals. So another example of an effective goal setting habit is called implementation intentions. This has been a really widely studied intervention in the literature and it's really simple. 
It's just a simple if-then statement. So, for example, if your goal is to purchase less food items in plastic, right? Uh, you would set a really simple goal. If I go to the supermarket, then I will not buy products packaged in plastic. And next time you go to the supermarket, you just remind yourself of this. And just the simple reminder really helps people change their behaviors and change their actions. But of course, this type of implementation intention works with smaller goals. So I wouldn't recommend someone saying like, if I want to live more sustainably, then I need to act more sustainable. That's too big of a goal uh, to try to achieve. But when you take it down and take it down in smaller steps, something like an implementation intention is really helpful for that. So in the context of fast fashion, if I go shopping, then I will not shop at H&M, for example. Or if I want to buy clothes, then I will buy them secondhand. And the next time you want to go buy clothes, you just think of that intention. And this idea of intending really shifts your focus and can really create effective habit formation and then therefore achievable goals. Interesting. And is it something you also use in your personal life? Yeah, yeah. So um, it's... Uh, something I, I've been trying to use more in my personal life. Uh, the example I gave you about buying plastic from grocery stores has been something I've been working on uh, myself. It's really interesting because uh, here in the Netherlands, there are lots of vegetables that are packaged in plastic. I feel like cucumbers, for example, a lot of the bigger cucumbers are packaged in plastic. And in America, that wasn't really something that I saw. And Other things such as like lettuce, like there are quite a few more vegetable products packaged in plastic uh, here in the Netherlands. So more recently, I've been trying to, you know, reduce the amount of plastic packaging that I take home with me from a grocery store. Well, I feel this method helps consumers in achieving their sustainable goals. But I notice myself and around me that it can be quite hard sometimes. And this relates to the following shame talk fragment that I want to show you. If you buy something, Willemijn, are you occupied with the sustainability aspect? Why or why not? Not as much as I want to. I think about the matter to buy sustainably. Um, but I do notice that it's also easy to make this seem less important. Maybe even to set it aside. Uh, this usually happens once I see a piece that I find very beautiful or that I think fits my personality well. Um, I also notice in my surroundings that people really relativize sustainability. They say things such as, oh, it won't be that bad, or what kind of influence do I really have? And this way, they don't really realize that their choices do have impact. Well, we talked about it a little bit just yet, but I'm sure this struggle of Willemijn is more common. And I experience it sometimes myself as well, because when I see a really nice shirt, um, but then it isn't sustainable, I set aside my own values and aspirations regarding my fashion choices as well. But why do you think it's so easy to blur the sustainability aspect into a background when it comes down to fashion choices? Yeah, I think... Um You know, coming back to this idea of temporal discounting uh, that I talked about, it's, I think, you know, you, you see a sale, and this is for myself as well, and I'd like to think of myself as, you know, somewhat knowledgeable on sustainability and, you know, somewhat um, cognizant of my carbon footprint on the environment. But even myself, you know, you see a really good sale, you see a really good deal, and you're like, oh, okay, like if I just just this one more time, I'll just, I'll buy this shirt or I can buy this really cute skirt that's so nice on the model and I think would look really nice here. And I think it's, it's really easy to, to think, oh, just, just one more, maybe one more. Or it's not going to have that big of an impact or it doesn't matter. But I think, you know, it, it really does come down to all of us as a collective, you know? So if all of us start moving in the more direction of, okay, no, we need to really, really take seriously uh, the impact that our choices have on the environment, then we make better collective choices together. And I think that um, that'll really influence the way that companies are pushing and the way that companies view their own marketing strategies and, you know, because companies will shift with based on what consumers want. 
And have you seen a change in this actually in the recent years? Yeah, yeah. And I think, I mean, I think just because of how pressing the matter of um, climate crisis is um, and how imminent it is and how we can see now really major impacts of um, our decisions as humans uh, in terms of, you know, carbon emissions and pollution and things like that. There's been a lot more uh, trends towards sustainability. You know, it's becoming, I think, more trendy. There are lots of sus more sustainable uh, fashion companies. Whether or not they actually are sustainable or not is something we'll, I guess, we'll discuss a bit later. But you do see this market trend towards people wanting to become more sustainable. Uh, I think that's actually a really good thing, you know, um, because we need to make it cool to be sustainable. We have to make it cool. And as we know in a lot of, um, you know, in marketing and uh, consumer behavior, it's really younger generations that create these trends uh you know so so even for example in social media when facebook first came out it was really only for younger people right and i think a lot of you know uh older generations didn't understand the technology but then a lot of you know kids were using facebook and then a lot of their parents started using facebook and then facebook kind of became a little bit outdated uh, because you had more things like Instagram pop up and now you have TikTok, which is like the newest, youngest type of uh, social media. And I think that it's it's really important and it's really good that a lot of uh, younger people and the younger generations, because we're more informed on this topic and we want to be more informed on this topic and we have the ability to look things up on Google. That's something that our parents didn't have. We have these mini computers in our pockets to just look up all this information. It's really great because I think that it's gonna be really predictive of uh, market habits and is gonna be pushing more people towards uh, buying more sustainably. When we talk about having an impact as a consumer, this of course relates to the sustainability debates. Uh, and we also discussed that we cannot solve the environmental challenges all by ourselves. So we need to be acting like a collective, but still we approach it really, yeah, individually. And participants in my shame talks questioned whether their choices have impact by asking me or saying to me, do my choices really have impact? And what do you believe is important within this struggle that uh, consumers have? I think that uh, it's really difficult uh, to remind yourself that your choices really do have an impact because, you know, you have uh, these really big companies uh, kind of working a little bit against you, uh, convincing you that you need this stuff, convincing you that you need to buy more things and look cool and look trendy and have the latest stuff. And I mean, they have huge marketing teams that, that push this on you, right? And you're just, you're just one person. But I think that this idea again of, of uh, cognitive dissonance is really important because if we really help people understand their cognitive dissonance and understand and uh, encourage them to, to live more in line with their values, it'll, actually help them have more self-agency uh, and become more self-agentic and have have more power in their lives. You know, we, I think we really need to empower people and their decision-making because it's not just, okay, if I don't buy fast fashion, like what impact is that really going to make? Well, it's going to make a really big impact because you'll be telling your friends about it. You'll be encouraging your friends not to buy from these fast fashion brands or to be more conscientious of uh, your fast fashion uh, consumption. And I think also giving people that type of power and that type of confidence will translate in other areas of their life. And I think more, more so in fashion, I think a lot of companies have this idea uh, to give you this image of yourself, you know? So a lot of people identify with the brands that they buy. I mean, you see this a lot in luxury goods, you know, you see lots of people who are like, oh, I only buy Gucci or I only buy Versace or 
I'm a Chanel girl, right? And you, it becomes an identity and you even see it in the actual pieces of clothing themselves, right? You see the monograms, you can recognize the, the um, Gucci symbol, those G's from like miles away, you know? It's like, and it's like kind of the identity and it's trendy and it's cool. And, and yeah, of course, of course you want to fit in because clothing is such a way of self-identification. It, it brings you a part of a tribe, you know, the type of clothing you wear, how you self-express yourself. It's, it really identifies you as part of a tribe. And I think the more that we empower consumers, the more that they'll realize that they have a lot more power than they think and that they don't just have to blindly follow what these companies and brands are projecting onto them as their self-image. Yeah, that's really interesting. I came across this term uh, in a book and it's called the supermarket of identities. And it actually means that capitalism runs on the principle of the ego of consumers that is constructed through buying products. And that is, of course, what you're speaking about as well. Like, yeah, we're buying Gucci because we want to be part of a specific group and we want to identify with other persons as well. But this, yeah, this term of supermarket of identities is something that really yeah got my interest because it's so focused on buying instead of who we really are as a person connected to our values and our beliefs but i also really like the part that you said like if you don't buy fast fashion anymore of course it will have a big influence because you um, will tell your friends about it and i came across an article by rutger brechman and he speaks of the three degrees of influence and that really helped me understand like whatever choice you make it always has influence because as you told us like if you don't buy fast fashion you will have a conversation about it with your friends like oh I don't go to H&M or to another fast fashion company anymore and those friends will think about it and they will tell their friends so however little change or choice you make it can have and it will have a big influence at least in the in your surroundings that's also a bit to uh, to the self agency actually of having the opportunity to make choices yourself as how i uh how i see self agency is that something you agree on or how do you see self agency i think with self agency i think that this is something that we need to promote more i think for people in general we need to promote the idea for people to be their own individuals and make their own choices. And personally speaking, I don't think that that's something we necessarily teach in schools. Well, I think that this self-agency relates to what I came across in my research. I noticed that the participants in the shame talks all have different values regarding sustainability. And when they don't behave sustainably in their eyes, they feel morally shamed. So it also means that a sustainable choice for one person isn't sustainable in the eyes of someone else. This is what makes moral shame complex, but at the same time really interesting as there is no specific view or value for everyone. But also the information provided by brands is questioned and I would like to show you the following fragment. Well, Willemijn, I was wondering, when you cannot manage to buy sustainably, what is the reason for this? I think this would be a habit. I find it very hard to break it. Um, I also believe that information overload plays its part. Because when you look into the matter, you receive so much information that um, at the end of the road, you might not even know what is sustainable and what isn't sustainable anymore. Uh, And this is definitely an obstacle for me. Well, we also talked a bit about it, but I noticed that this knowledge or this information is quite an important theme. And I came across an article that describes how sustainability, but also the word green and environmental friendly don't have legal definitions. So brands use these loose definitions and it allows them for an interpretation of what the specific company actually means. And I was wondering, what is your perspective on this in relation to sustainability? And can you relate to this um, matter of not having a fixed definition for everyone? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, greenwashing and the exact definitions of environmentally friendly is really a tricky uh, subject to navigate. And I think because of how difficult it is to find uh, transparent information 
on what brands are doing to be more sustainable or how they themselves are being more sustainable is gives you a really big feeling of helplessness and kind of uselessness. And I think that, um, again, like I had mentioned before, it's, it's hard to remember that it's you as an individual that have to make all of these decisions like against or for a big company with huge legal and huge marketing teams working to promote these ideas of sustainability and being greener and that also work to hide how they're not being so sustainable. I think that uh, I have a lot of my own frustrations also in understanding what sustainable really is. Is it the types of fabrics that they use? Is it the amount of water used in the process of making clothing? Is it the, uh, you know, you can say something's 100% cotton, but, you know, where were these cotton fields produced? Are we creating huge monocultures of cotton and things like that? And it just seems from my own personal, I guess, opinion that buying secondhand clothing seems to be the best option uh, in terms of being more sustainable. But you know, a lot of times secondhand clothing is more expensive than newer clothing from fast fashion companies, which is also really sad. I think this also has to go back to the idea of being trendy. You know, it's now very trendy to buy things from vintage stores and from vintage boutiques. And I think that's so great, of course, but a lot of times these secondhand, like a secondhand sweater can still cost 15, 20 euros, even if it's not like a name brand and you can buy a much cheaper sweater for five euros from like an H&M or a Zara. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a really tricky subject to navigate. And like I said, I think it really leads consumers to feel helpless in their decisions. But again, circling back to this idea of really making sure that we give people the knowledge and the tools to make smarter decisions, better informed decisions, and give them that sense of agency and their own identity rather than being led astray by these huge companies. Again, I think we often forget that H&M is a name, but we see it everywhere in every single uh, country, it, almost every single country. And it, they grow in, they uh, bring in so much money. I mean, they have so much money to just have these huge teams of people to just trick you or to, to really uh, be able to frame things in a way that's still making it look like they're more sustainable, even if even if they're not. I know there's, you know, there's a lot of greenwashing even with other companies in terms of saying that they use recycled plastics in their in their uh, shampoo bottles when it's like okay, 25% of the bottle is recycled plastic and only some of of their products are even made with this 25% of recycled plastic. So I think I think it's just a really tricky subject to navigate, but I think it's really good that it's opening up a wider conversation of deciding what is sustainable and how to find this information. And I think more and more people are working on making this information transparent and holding these companies accountable. So we just discussed how the information brands provide is difficult to navigate in. And I believe this relates to the following fragment of the Shame Talks. Do you on for and search for information about the product, Anouk? Well, to be honest, only with my sport clothes. Then I will look at the fabric on how does it work with sweating during when I'm doing sports and how is the air supply within the garment. And I'm really focused and interested about the technical aspects. I noticed in the shame talks that a lot of the participants were not occupied with searching for information on forehand. So it's really quite ad hoc. So they just go into the city center or enter a website and just buy products without thinking about it too much or without searching uh, for information. And I see that uh, or I notice that it's, yeah, that they approach it quite passively. But when you, for example, buy a phone or buy some other products like food, you are more occupied uh, with searching for the technical aspects or, yeah, what do I need to add in my recipe? You are more focused on searching for more information. 
And uh, I was wondering, do you believe it's important to take matters in our own hands and search for this information ourselves? So we become active instead of passive. Um, so we educate ourselves in sustainable behavior. Or what do you believe will influence this passive behavior? I think that, you know, it's... It's really interesting because we know that there are different types of consumers, right? And I'm, I'm sure you came across this in your research. You have uh, the consumer who's very much more focused on like hedonistic pleasure from the actual buying of the garment, um, you know, spending the money or getting that, getting that excitement from placing the order. And then you get that second excitement when the package comes to your house. You know, it's a, it's a bit of a rush, right? Then you have other types of consumers who... Uh, really focus more on, um, you know, self-expression and how they look. And again, you know, fitting into a tribe. And then you have other types of consumers who are more concerned with more socially, like, sacrificial type of ideas in terms of in terms of uh, consumerism. So, uh, you know, making certain sacrifices to shop more sustainably. I think it's really important for us you know, to encourage people to take matters into their own hands. You mentioned this before as well, and you came across it in your own research, uh, how a lot of brands can really buy uh, your values and your belief systems, and they can buy your identity from you and market your identity towards you. And I think that that really can be mitigated through education, through not just straight education in terms of knowledge, but education in terms of really teaching people how to think critically. And that I think really just starts in schools, starts like from a very young age. You know, we have to teach young children how to think critically, not just answer questions or, or figure out the right answer, but really think for themselves what they, uh, and be able to examine their own thoughts. Um, I think that has to do, I think it, in part is going to have to change a little bit about the way that we educate younger people and people in general how to mitigate and manage their own emotions and their own thoughts. I don't think that that's something that we really uh, teach to people. We don't really teach people how to observe their own thoughts. Um, I, you know, I, I've I've done quite a bit of research on mindfulness, uh, for example, right? And I have my own mindfulness practice as well. And I think those types of practices really help you observe your thoughts and understand your own inner world. I think a lot of people are uncomfortable with sitting down by themselves and sitting down with their own thoughts and really evaluating their own values. It's really interesting now during the pandemic, the types of anxieties and things like that that have come around from the pandemic due to the fact that we were just all home and isolated and alone with our own thoughts. And um, it was really hard for lots of people, including myself, uh, you know, to, to kind of be more alone with your own thoughts and your own ideas. And I think that the more we educate people on how to you know, be more self-agentic on how to observe their own thoughts, on how to really evaluate their values and evaluate the behaviors that are going on in their life. The more that people will be making uh, decisions that are more in line with, with their values and they'll be able to act better on those types of desires that they have. Yeah, interesting. Also, because I was thinking about the educating part and it is also... I didn't get any education uh, at all during my uh, well high school and also um, like middle school. And I noticed that we lack sustainable sensoriality. And that is actually the way of understanding a product from the knowledge of how it's made through its raw material towards the end product rather than just through consumption. Because I feel like we know fashion and how it works but solely as a economic product, so through consumption. But we have a lack of knowledge about how it's made, who is making the clothes, how much kilometers it's traveling to come here into the stores. And I believe that, yeah, we can only get this knowledge by educating ourselves, but also educating our surroundings, educating it on schools. 
Because, yeah, as I said before, a lot of uh, consumers are quite passive or they don't know where to look, where to find the information because there's a lot of information out there. But I believe when we indeed take matters in our own hands and try to educate ourselves and the, and the people in our surroundings, we can get this sustainable sensoriality back and can help us implementing our own values in our consumer behavior. Yeah, yeah. And I think I think you have such a good point. We don't we now have been more recently focusing more on the consumption aspect of it, which is which is excellent. That's a really excellent place to start. But you're right, we we forget, okay, how did my clothing get here? What kinds like I had mentioned before, what kinds of uh, chemicals were used to produce it? Where where is that chemical waste? being disposed of it's being disposed of in our waterways where is that ending up you know a huge problem is is microplastic fibers in our in our clothing and this ending up in our waterways and then ending up in then the food that we eat you know apparently we eat on average uh one plastic credit card a year worth of plastic in our food that's crazy that's insane uh, to think about and it's just because you know, we of of how these types of other impacts that are are so hidden from us, right? I think I think our consumption is something that's really on the forefront uh, and something that's really can be really seen. But you forget the hidden costs of why is my shirt so cheap? Yeah, and the hidden human cost. I mean, that's a a huge topic on on workers' rights and where these companies are outsourcing their labor and how they're treating their garment workers and and even using you know child labor like child sweatshops like children making your clothes for literally cents on the hour because that's just you know who came who came to their their town what what sources what resources they have available for them to make money to provide for their families and it's you know and it's uh, it's really terrible i think you know, I think part of the reason why we don't discuss it is because of how terrible these human rights violations are. Because no one wants to think about, you know, the people struggling to make ends meet that are making these clothes for you. You know, you you see the sale, you see the red sale sign, and you think, again, about the shorter term reward. This is going to be better for my wallet. And I mean, I think it's also difficult, too, because it's, I mean, not everyone can afford to spend money on sustainable clothes it's really unfortunate you know that sustainable clothes can be really expensive especially buying secondhand can be really expensive and i mean people have to wear clothes and of course you want to look nice in the world that's extremely important again it, it comes to this idea of self-expression self-identity of belonging to a tribe and um you know this human being need to belong. That's something that is so integral to the human experience. So I think it's just really hard because people don't want to constantly think about the human cost or the environmental cost uh, of these types of decisions. But again, I mean, we see the landscape shifting in terms of how we talk about this and how the amount of times we bring up these conversations and the extent to which we discuss these conversations yeah, and that's, well, you mentioned the, how I call it, the harmful side, like the child labor, the general labor issues in the fashion industry. And that is why I struggle a lot with fashion as well. On the one hand, I really enjoy it. Um, but on the other hand, I really hate it because all of these harmful situations that a lot of people are um, are put in. And last year I was researching the labor issues because I did a bachelor studies um, fashion and management and it's really focused on the production side of fashion. So I uh, knew all the practicalities of what journey a garment has over the world in the factories, but then what happens after it's made, how it's being uh, shipped off to Europe, for example. But never the human aspect was included, actually. And I started researching that last year and I was, I knew 
already a bit what was going on, but I was really shocked. And I, I create a statement that always was in the back of my mind when I talk about human labor, and that is that the fashion industry hides human labor behind a glitzy facade. And this shows to me the importance of regaining the sustainable sensoriality, as I believe it will help other consumers as well as the feeling of moral shame. I think it is also part of the answer to the question we questioned at the beginning. More specifically, what plays an important part within the relationship between moral shame and unsustainable consumer behavior? It's all related to the themes we just discussed, so that we're focused on the short term instead of the long term, how we see ourselves as the ones who are responsible for not making sustainable choices, and how everyone has different values regarding sustainability but also the vague and hidden information in the fashion industry. But I must say, I see our conversation and moral shame and the podcast series as something hopeful, as it's quite a relevant feeling nowadays. It shows that we're opening up conversations about sustainability, consumer behavior, about our personal experience, and also that moral shame is not a paralyzing emotion, but is relevant for current times. And with this positive note, I would like to end the last episode of this podcast series. And thank you, Christine, for your interesting insights, views and perspectives from a behavioral science point of view. Thank you so much for having me, Wendy.